people only had muskets, uh, the government had to be pretty careful. Uh, when people only had horses, there was only so much they could do. Uh, when you have one side that has the largest surveillance machine that has ever been completed on a global basis in the history of humanity, and they have the exclusive use of it, and we, on the other hand, have smartphones that are saying everywhere we go all the time, every purchase we make, every website we visit, we need to think about what that means. It means we are creating permanent records of our daily activities that could be used for purposes that we will never know and have no say in. And suddenly the devices that were designed to empower you can now be used to disempower you. They can be used to make you vulnerable. They can be used to watch you. And that is what's happening right now. We are living lives of unparalleled vulnerability to power. We live in a very safe time. Let's make no mistake about that, right? Everybody plays up the threat of terrorism. But if you look at any metric of mortality, uh, if you look at any metric of quality of life, we're doing pretty good uh, relative to historic circumstances. Yet at the same time, uh, our ability to resist uh, powerful institutions, be they corporate, be they governmental, has never been less than it is today. Metadata, uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, the content of communications is what you're actually saying on the phone call, what you're actually writing in the body of the email, uh, what you actually write inside the Facebook message. Metadata is one step out from that, and it has no meaningful legal protections in our current uh, Western jurisprudence, which is the real danger, uh, because the government holds that you don't actually own records of your activities, right? You only have a privacy interest in actually what you say, but not anything that anybody records about when you said it, how you said it, how long it took you to say it, things like that. Uh, when you have enough metadata, you don't need the content. Metadata is a proxy for content because machines can analyze it uh, in a way that content can't. Uh, metadata is, creates perfect records of private lives. How do we protect the fact that the communication occurred at all in the first place, the metadata, right? There's what you said, and then there's also the fact that you said something at all. Can we protect the fact that you called your mother your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your professor, whatever. You called uh, a hospital. Uh, you called an abortion clinic. You called a uh, political group. You called a church. Uh, any connection, where you spend your money, how you do it, where you travel, when you cross a border. You know. school surveillance, right, that used to be targeted, you'd send a private eye to follow people around. Uh, and they would see these people leave their homes in the morning. They would write down what time of day they got up, where they left, the means of conveyance. They went in this car, it had this license plate number. This is metadata. Uh, no legal protections for it. You'd go to the cafe, you'd meet with someone. They couldn't sit so close to you that they heard everything you said because you'd go, who is this weirdo following me around? This is metadata. Uh, no legal protections for it, but they'd sit near enough to see who you met, how long you were there, you know, uh, and be able to sort of assess the context of, of that relationship. Is this someone that he meets with all the time? Uh, is this a lover? Is this a spouse? You can tell by the frequency of contact. You can tell by do they spend the night with each other all the time and these things like that. This is metadata. Uh, no legal protections for it. Now they're doing that instantly for everyone always because it's cheap, it's easy, it's free. By f following your cell phone. So on, 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 so on
universally unique identifier or globally unique identifier, right? These, you can think of them as little trip tags that are burned into the hardware of the device. They can't be changed on a permanent basis, uh, at least without serious expertise. Uh, and this means that every time you connect to one of these networks, your device is different from every other device in the world that could be connected to it. Uh, there are meaningful technical reasons for this to happen, right? This wasn't a surveillance scheme. But a byproduct of this is that suddenly the devices that were designed to empower you can now be used to disempower you. They can be used to make you vulnerable. They can be used to watch you. And that is what's happening, 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 happening. in bulk, this collection that's happening with everyone and no court needs to be involved because again, uh, they say you don't own these records, Facebook owns these records, the cell phone company owns this record of where your cell phone went, not you, right? So they can do whatever they want with it. They can hand it to the government voluntarily, they can provide it in response to a subpoena or a court order, which is not so objectionable, right? Companies can turn over things uh, if the court says we have probable cause to believe this person's a criminal. But what if they do it for everyone all the time, everywhere? What if the government cuts out the middleman and starts doing it themselves by tapping the uh, cross-border fiber optic communications that connect, for example, Canada to the United States or other countries? Well, the problem is the internet doesn't live in Canada, right? The internet lives all over the world. So the minute your communications go uh, to Facebook or Google or Yahoo or anything like this, any major service that anybody's using, you know, uh, you go to iTunes, that's creating a record that these people now didn't have to go to court to uh, have on you. But we found out just last month that in fact Yahoo, one of the major internet uh, companies, uh, had decided beyond what the law required uh, that they would scan all of their customers' emails on behalf of U.S. intelligence. Now, they could have contested this in court, but they chose not to because they thought it would be secret and that nobody would find out. This is a danger of having companies that store enormous amounts of data on their customers. If you build it, they will come. Uh, what does encryption mean? Um, for, for those who don't understand that mass surveillance problem with the metadata that we talked about earlier, uh, the problem is when you think about the internet, how it actually works, how it fits together, when you send a text message, uh, when you send a Facebook message, how does that actually get from your phone to the other person's phone, right? Well, it's got to travel over this no man's land of the internet. All of these systems that are physically connected, right? The fiber optic cables, the satellite links, all the radio hops, the microwave uh, connections. Uh, you don't see any of this, it just happens, right? But it's there. And all of those people in the middle have a chance to look at that communication. If it's an SMS, right, a normal text message that you send, it's completely unencrypted. Anybody in the middle can read what it is, they can store what it is, they can save what it is. Uh, the same thing for normal emails that are sent unencrypted. Uh, web traffic that's not HTTPS at the front of the bar, right, that's just HTTP, that's unencrypted, so anybody can see that. Uh, but if you encrypt it now, suddenly all they have is the metadata. They can't actually read that interior transmission. What this means is that governments have been exploiting this property to collect all of that stuff for free as your communications cross the internet electronically naked. Encryption allows us to armor our communications to walk through that dangerous valley and get to the other side with some dignity left intact. Uh, that's the first thing that we need to establish to protect the content of our communications. This gives us an idea, a framework, of a safer world, particularly for journalists and individuals uh, uh, who have uh, a real need, right? Not just uh, a rights-based need, but a professional need, uh, perhaps a safety-based need. Because if you're a journalist in Beijing or Moscow or somewhere else, uh, and the government can see who you're contacting, that could actually get people jailed, killed, or worse. Uh, we need to move to a paradigm where all of our communications are encrypted by default.
We have an obligation and we have a right to change the game and say, yes, if governments, if courts want to monitor criminals, they can do so. Uh, they can go to a judge. They can say, this is the evidence that we need to monitor this individual. But the days where they could monitor everyone, everywhere, all the time, simply what the government calls uh, by means of bulk collection, which is the government euphemism for mass surveillance. They say, we just want to collect everything in store in case we want to search it later. Those days are numbered. We are going to move towards a freer and fairer future rather than simply the one that has already been laid out for us. We are at a decision point and we can have a very dark future or a very bright future, but the ultimate determination of which fork in the road we take won't be my decision. Uh, it won't be the government's decision. It will be your generation's decision. And I'm looking forward to seeing what it is that you guys actually decide.